So welcome everyone uh, to our final faculty chalk talk of the fall 2020 semester. For those of you who haven't joined us before today, uh, our professors at the Tisch Institute for Global Sport created these weekly installments to discuss topics across sports business. And tonight's session is entitled The Athlete's Voice, Activism and Social Responsibility. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, um, I'm new to NYU. Uh, my name is Professor Gina Antoniello, a first, first year full-time faculty member. And before coming to NYU, I spent a good part of the last 10 years uh, in leadership roles in the NBA, leading uh, communications programs uh, within the Brooklyn Nets and Golden State Warriors organizations. And with that, I was able to work directly with uh, professional athletes on social responsibility platforms, as well as help find ways to amplify their voices, particularly on issues that transcend sport. So joining me in a few minutes, as you guys all see on your screen, uh, is NBA veteran Lance Thomas. And he recently played for the Brooklyn Nets in the NBA bubble. And we're gonna talk about his experiences, uh, both as a player and as a citizen, as a community leader who contributed and has contributed immensely to his communities. So let's set the table a little bit for the topic tonight, okay? Athlete activism and its development has been amplified by the current social, political, and economic climate, and through its existence, has really been viewed through prisons of, of change, right? So many believe that, for instance, Colin Kaepernick's kneeling against police brutality has no place on the football field, as much as they believe that WNBA players, for instance, have every right to reject their most recent collective bargaining agreement. Today's athlete activists are, um, they're, they're knowledgeable, they're deliberate, uh, they're reflective, um, they're responding thoughtfully to social is issues such as police brutality and profiling, uh, persistent racial gaps in education or income, and even gender and sexuality policies outside of the world of sport. They're voicing these concerns in concert with other public and community leaders and often in direct collaboration with each other, as we've seen. So sometimes, you know, their motivations are, are quite personal stemming from their own ongoing uh, individual experiences with racism, or they're supporting communities of color, their communities, um, the ones that continue to face persistent racism and discrimination. So how does this relate to sport? How does this impact um, the business, right? That's what we're looking to, to really examine here. And the economic, the political, the social impacts of this activism on the business of sport, both domestically and internationally, we know, we know this year it's undeniable. These movements, these demonstrations, uh, the controversies engulfing leagues and players and fans, it is not going away anytime soon. So from a sport business education perspective, how can we better understand, how can we better analyze social justice issues related to athlete activism to develop maybe newer, different, possibly more effective strategies to reconcile the interests of all of the stakeholders in the industry? Is it possible? So before we dig into this and more, um, I am proud to introduce my friend, Lance Thomas. Thank you for joining me tonight, Lance. Gina, thank you. It's always a pleasure and uh, really good to see you. Thanks for inviting me. So um, your career uh, and that you've worked so hard for and you continue to has been marked by excellence and longevity. Standout player at St. Benedict's, shout out to Jersey, uh, national championship at Duke, go Blue Devils, and a 10-year career in the NBA. Tell us a little bit more about you and your journey. Uh, well, I, I can honestly say that I've, uh, I've scratched and clawed my way to where I am, and uh, I wouldn't change my journey uh, at all. Um, I wasn't a guy who had the opportunity to to you know, shake the commissioner's hand uh, on a draft night. I was a guy who won a national championship, like you said, and as amazing as that was, you think like, all right, next you have an opportunity to play in the NBA, right? Like you at least would have a look or an opportunity to try out for a team or anything like that. Um, none of that happened for me. And uh, I had to have you know uh, a real talk with myself, like, hey, how bad do you want this? And to, really recondition my mind uh, 
for that next journey, right? And it was, you know, do I go overseas, you know, and, you know, try to, you know, make quick money for me and my family, or do I, you know, go about, you know, chasing my dream of playing in the NBA? And I had a conversation with my mother and I asked her, I was like, are we really pressing for money right now? Because I can go overseas, you know, now and try to, you know, uh, make some money for us and then go, you know, try to come back and play in the NBA. And she was like, we're fine. Chase your dream. She was like, I know how hard you worked since you were a little kid playing at Haven Park in Jersey, you know, to, you know, uh, playing at St. Benedict's and, you know, winning state, uh, state prep championships to going to Duke and losing in the first, you know, uh, NCAA game my freshman year, sophomore year losing the second game, third year losing the third game, you know, so obviously if you, you know, you go by the numbers, you would think I would have lost my fourth game, but we actually figured out how to win and we won the national championship. And uh, she knows that when I put my mind to something, I get it done. And uh, that's always been my mindset. Um, I've always, you know, tried to uh, push my myself as far as I can and push those around me and uh, it's always worked out for me so I had an opportunity to play in the development league uh, first out and I was in Austin playing with the Austin Toros and grinded through that and then the NBA was in a lockout my first my rookie season so there was no basketball being played at the time and um, for the Pan American games uh, for USA basketball there was no NBA guys playing so they used some of the better guys from the development league and I happened to be one of the guys that they chose to play. And I had a good showing and I was invited to training camp from New Orleans. And by God's good graces, I had an opportunity to play. And, you know, uh, I had a series of 10 day contracts where you have 10 days to prove that you belong. And that is one of the biggest, you know, uh, you know, one of the biggest just, uh, just in your mind, it's just like, what are they looking for? Right, it's one of those things where like, in those 10 days, you don't, you might not play in the game, right? So what are they really looking at? And I, I knew that, you know, um, the things that I bring to the table, uh, I was gonna do that regardless of someone who's watching or not, right? Being a great teammate, um, making sure that, you know, I'm not working, you know, everyone, uh, making sure that I don't lose a sprint when we're in practice, um, you know, uh, trying to uplift somebody when I see that they're in a funk, you know, even if I'm not on the team, you know, and uh, all these things were things that, you know, I do by accident. These aren't things that I do, you know, to try to be a little kiss ass, you know, for a coach or a GM. And, um, you know, it worked out for me. And uh, again, like I mentioned early, you know, when we were talking, uh, I wouldn't change my journey at all. Now, you know, this common thread of, you know, you consult your mom, you know, you're uh, there for your teammates. You're showing up every single day while you're scratching and clawing for that career uh, to make a difference and to have your dream of playing in the NBA. And somehow um, from day one, uh, you've been very involved in, in giving back. So you're still looking to others even outside of your career. What sparked your, you know, your start with, with giving back and, and your involvement in social responsibility, responsibility causes? Uh, I mean, that goes from my upbringing. Uh, my mom, uh, my grandfather, you know, uh, people who um, are uh, servant leaders, you know, people who care about, you know, the success of other people before their own individual success. And I saw that on a very intimate level as a kid, you know, being able to see, you know, uh, my mom go and work, you know, for long hours and come home. I knew she'd be exhausted, but she came home with a smile on her face. My grandfather, who, you know, he left the house at four in the morning, he came back, you know, <laughs> at six, seven o'clock. My grandmother made him a plate and then he was asleep, you know, it's like, cause he had to wake up again. So I knew what hard work looked like and I knew what making others feel good felt like because they made me feel good. And, uh, you know, that became my identity. That was, these were the, the people that I looked up to, right? My uncle Monty, my aunt Raquel, like these are all people who really have pushed me, you know, to be, you know, to take that to another level and, you know, uh, Coach Danny Hurley at St. Benedict's was someone who really pushed me. Um, probably uh, one of the toughest guys that you know I've ever played for, um, but probably my uh, one of my most influential uh, leaders in my life, just because uh, he got me ready for the real world. He got me ready to play at Duke. He got me ready to play for you know the best coach in basketball and Coach K. Um, and you know I was also a part of uh, New Heights NYC. Um, and we had 
Uh, a lot of, you know, really good leaders that were there that really pushed me, uh, Nick Blashford, Adam Berkowitz, um, these guys, uh, we also, you know, Ted Smith, who's a director of New Heights, um, you know, trying to create the ultimate student athlete. Um, and it was crazy. I was part of that organization at the grassroots level. And uh, you look, you know, you fast forward to now, I'm on the board of directors for the nonprofit. So I'm getting to really help, you know, uh, further the mission and the success of the overall program. And we have a new home that's going to be in Brooklyn, you know, for the kids uh, to not have to bounce around from gym to gym. We have a home, you know, in Brooklyn, which would be awesome and uh, really excited about that. But as far as, you know, uh, the giving back goes, it, it was just something that I love to do. Um, and it was something that I do a lot more than people think. Uh, and I, I don't want to pat, I don't want to pat on the back for it. Right? I do it because it needs to be done. I do it because it's the right thing to do. You know, I don't post on Instagram everything that I do because people would think it's very obnoxious. Like, oh my God, he's looking for attention. No, I do it because it brings me joy and it, it, it's infectious, right? It, it, the people around me see me do it and then they reach out to me like, hey, how can I help next time? How can I do this, right? So um, it's really awesome to be able to, you know, to lead by example, right? I'm not someone who's gonna ask somebody to do something I wouldn't do myself. You know, and the big part of leadership, you know, is being able to, you know, not only hold, you know, others accountable, but hold yourself accountable. And these are things that I've lived my whole life, you know, doing, and I know no other way to be. You know, uh, professional athletes and just as a participant of society um, have either faced or witnessed pro these problematic instances of social inequality. Um, you know, social justice and sports have collided for decades and they form this reciprocal relationship. Athletes use platforms, use their platforms to raise awareness, right, about these issues, whether it be because of a personal experience or to speak up on a controversial issue. Um, and it seems that these that athletes in general have been way more vocal um, since, since Cap's, uh, you know, 2016 when he started um, being very visible with his protests. In your 10 year career in the NBA, uh, do you believe that the climate has changed for athletes to be more vocal without fearing employment consequences? Absolutely. And uh, I, I think that ultimately it really comes down to the athlete, right? Um, do you really believe in the things that you're saying or are you saying things for attention, right? And, you know, there are, you know, athletes who speak you know, from the heart and really feel a certain way about specific issues. And um, with the way of the world now, where the world is really social media driven, right? Uh, and, and we have a, a bigger platform than some of the, you know, the, the greats, you know, in sports from, you know, the past, you know, they were superstars, you know, um, you, you name it, you know, Michael Jordan, uh, all these other people who have really been pioneers to the game. They didn't have Instagram, they didn't have Twitter, they didn't have all these things, right? So if they didn't get addressed in a press conference, you know, that was the only time they really could speak up about something, right? Nowadays, you can tweet something, you know, from the, from your couch, you know, with your feet up, you know, in your, or in your recliner chair, and really talk about things that, you know, are really important to you as an athlete. And again, there are some, you know, athletes who are in different positions, right? They're, the, the professional athlete arranges from, you know, the guy who just made the team, right to be a superstar right and there's everything in between right so certain guys you know who have made x amount of money in the in whatever sport they're playing you know they they don't really fear you know the the financial you know uh you know repercussions that come with actually vocalizing something that might be controversial right but excuse me someone who you know has really finally got their foot in the door might feel a certain way but they're going to bite their tongue, you know, out of fear of scrutiny, um, out of fear of, you know, they might not have endorsement deals, right? But they don't, don't want to be, you know, someone who is looked at as a nuisance or as someone who's going to bring bad publicity to an organization, right? And, you know, the, the, the 15th guy on an NBA team or the 14th guy, those guys are seen as replaceable. Right, and that just goes with the business, right? You can find, you know, other guys who can fill those spots, right? So a guy, you know, like myself now, you know, as an older player in the league, 
you know, I worked my way from being one of the, you know, seventh or eighth guys on the team to being one of these guys, you know, the 14, 15 guy, and that's okay with me, right? And it's not, it's not a failure, you know, it's, it's not uh, something that uh, is looked down upon or uh, me feeling like I, you know, uh, not reaching my potential, right? Like, I speak on things that are very important to me. And, you know, what you have to realize, especially, you know, when you, you know, go into philanthropy, or if you go into, you know, speaking your, you know, your piece on something that is very important to you, is that you can't make everybody happy, right? There's nothing that one person can do to make everyone happy, right? And once you get that in your mind, it gives you kind of, you know, it knocks some little weight off your shoulders a little bit. And it's like, you know what? I'm saying this because I really feel it, you know? And you can tell the athletes who speak from the heart and those who are just looking for attention. I think it's pretty obvious. You know, as a professor, as an educator, as someone that, um, you know, works with athletes to help them find their authentic voice, I look to research. And, you know, sociologists in particular, uh, Kaufman and Wolf in 2010, their study suggested that playing a sport and protesting are not mutually exclusive. In fact, rather, individuals should be encouraged to find the connections between the two and understand how to marry ideals of democracy, of consciousness, of collectivism. And the findings actually say that athletes, um, their engagement in protest and activism impacts the way they see themselves and themselves in the world. So. Can you describe, you know, your personal relationship between your individual action of late um, and your identity? Yeah, um, I do uh, consider myself someone who um, is an activist, someone who actually, you know, speaks up on things that uh, are important to me. But what needs to be addressed, especially for athletes, if you're going to speak on something, do your research first. Don't just speak because you have the platform. Don't just speak because you have a following, right? If you're not gonna do the research and actually back up, you know, the reason why you think that way with hard facts, it's best to keep your mouth shut because there's gonna be those people who scratch and claw and try to figure out, okay, he said this, why do you think that? Where did you, where did, what sources did you look at? You know, and if you're not ready to answer those questions, we're looked at as dumb athletes, right? And we already, you know, have the, you know, the, the stereotype of not being, educated and not being smart like that just comes with it and people you know already have you know that mindset on athletes in general not just basketball players athletes in general right um and uh you know it's professional athletes in general like some of us didn't graduate you know in college but that doesn't mean you're not educated that doesn't mean you don't read that doesn't mean that you're not updated on current events that doesn't mean you don't research certain things right but in a world where you know, uh, you know, a diploma or something really defines how smart you are, right? Um, the leagues, you know, that have all these players who may not have graduated, you know, we're looked at as shut up and play your sport, right? As opposed to, no, I actually have educated myself on this and I feel this way and you can ask me any question you want about it and I will dissect everything that you asked me and deliver it and show you that I know what I'm talking about. So I consider myself one of those people who have done the research and have been able to really speak on certain things because I know what I read, I know what I'm talking about. So I stand where I say uh, it's very important to me to have the voice, right? I'm by no means a superstar in the league. I've never been one, probably will never be one, but that doesn't mean that my platform is invaluable. That doesn't mean that I don't have people who, you know, value me as a human being, uh, who really, you know, look up to me and people who actually want to hear what I have to say. So I can wholeheartedly say that anybody who's a fan of mine, anyone who's a supporter of mine, anyone who's a friend of mine, a family member of mine, they know that I don't open my mouth without knowing what the heck I'm talking about. Um, I want to get into something that is, is, is very difficult to talk about. Um, the whole world watch. Um, as George Floyd uh, died at the hands of the police in Minneapolis a few months ago, uh, we know that it sparked global protests. Um, we know that athletes from Serena Williams to LeBron James made statements. Some came together to actually organize and um, it sparked a movement. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, did you watch the video? Uh, I did, and I was disgusted. Um, you you think about uh, no matter what stance you have on it, if you watch that video, it is disgusting. It is it's horrifying. You can say whatever you wanted to say that happened before that. Nobody, no human being can withstand a knee or that much pressure on one of the softest parts of your body, you know, for that long. And you expect them to be able to, you know, to live through that, you know, and, you know, me, I do my research, right? Wednesday, you know, they went to trial on uh, 9-11. Uh, that was when they actually had, you know, their first hearing. The documents from that uh, that case was it showed that Sheldon uh, might not pronounce his name wrong, but I really don't care about him. I think that he's what he did was unforgivable. But um, it showed that there were instances in the past. I believe they said that there were seven instances in the past where he's used that excessive force on people, and four out of the seven were in instances where it was just overly, you know, he he, he did it for no reason. Right, just as a, a flex of authority, right? And in this instance, it took someone's life, right? And it, it was it was disgusting. And I think that, you know, uh, as far as you know how that goes, you know, obviously he's tried, you know, uh, and, and the you know the other officers that were there, you know, they're they're being held accountable, right? But uh, a lot can happen uh, until their trial on March eighth. You know, I believe that's when their trial is supposed to be. And you never know what's gonna happen. You know, there's there's a lot of, you know, important people who can, you know, make crazy things happen. We've seen it before, right? So all that, you know, I can do that we all can do is pray that justice is served. How did you feel about the response from the athlete community, particularly, you know, NBA players, former NBA players and, you know, utilizing their platforms to give light to this response, to this anger, to this hurt. I think that it really showed that a, a lot of people are fed up. And uh, when we talk about athletes who actually spoke up about it, right? We're not even like, I'm gonna omit, you know, all the athletes that were black, right? There were a lot of white athletes that were very disgusted by this, right? And what, the black community, I can say this as a black male, we know that all white people are not racist, right? And that is something that needs to be addressed, right? Not all whites are racist. Not all white cops are bad cops, right? But there is always bad apples, right? And they need to be held accountable, right? Like if, if the, you know, his fellow officer saw that he had excessive force with that knee on him and he was already still cuffed because they put him in the car you're right, he was sitting in the car and then they pulled him out, he landed on his face and then that's when the knee came down. He's cuffed already. Two other officers had his knee. They were holding his legs down. Why is the knee on him right there? Why can't you put a knee in his back, right? He wouldn't be able to move. He had hands behind his back, his face is in the concrete. Put your knee in his back. You know, he, he, he wasn't gonna move regardless, but I think that, uh, you know, we know that, you know, again, all whites aren't racist and all white cops aren't racist. But again, like, like I said, I, I feel like I'm repeating myself, but people need to be held accountable, right? And if, you know, you can make this, you know, parallel in sports, right? If the leader of a team sees that one of his teammates is doing something wrong, right? Doing something that's gonna hinder the progress of the team, right? Every, everyone's goal is to be successful, right? If you see someone that's doing something that they're not supposed to do, you interject, you stop it right then and there so that it doesn't become a longer issue. It doesn't become something that's prolonged and becomes a lingering issue, right? That's what you do as a leader, right? That also been, you know, uh, the instance in that situation. Hey, get your knee off his neck. He's down already, we got him. Like mm -hmm. that could have been the voice of one of his fellow officers and that mm -hmm. wasn't, that didn't happen. So I am disgusted by that. But again, uh, I really hope justice is served on March 8th. So much pain, um, so much reconciling, um, you know, and in this year, in the context, the context of this year, unprecedented, you know, in the world of basketball um, and how these external forces have kind of converged on, the, on all of these circumstances. You have at the outset of the year, um, the passing of Commissioner Emeritus, uh, David Stern, 
the tragic loss of Kobe, COVID-19 with the season being suspended, all sports stopping, um, you know, and then the protests um, that continue to endure. And then there's this return to play, you know, for the NBA in the bubble. Um, when you're working through this as, as a human being, like we all are, um, what went into your decision to sign with the Nets and, and play during this time? Um, I, like me personally, uh, you know this because we've been friends for almost 15 years. Um, I like to disconnect and I like to go in the Gulf of Mexico and uh, that's, that's my happy place. I go fishing, I like to be out there. Um, it's serene, um, so much serenity out there. Um, and it's a place where I can collect my thoughts. There's no, there's nothing out there that is distracting to me. And I remember, you know, leading right up to, you know, the call from Brooklyn, I was fishing those few days and I, it was out there with my team, my fishing team, Slang Magic. And we, you know, they, they just noticed that I was a little uneasy about, you know, certain things. And they were like, what's wrong? I was like, this is crazy. Like, you know, like when you actually just sit back and just think about what has been going on, you know, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's scary, you know, for a black man, you know, to be, you know, in, in certain instances, right? And um, I've personally feared my life a few times in, in instances where getting pulled over, you know, with officers. And, you know, I put my hands in the wheel, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, you know, and it's, you know, it's just an instance where you don't know what mood they're in, or you don't know what happened to them in the morning with their personal lives or with their family. So what what cop are you going to get? Are you going to get a good cop? Are you going to get a, a bad cop who just wants to stir the pot, right? And I've been in the car, you know, while I got pulled over with some of my white friends. And I'm like, you'll be cool. I'm driving. Like, you need to shut up. Don't say nothing. And I've watched some of my, you know, white friends literally curse the cops out. Like, what are you pulling us over for? And just going at them. And I'm sitting here like, this could get bad. And I'm watching the cop just take it like, all right, you don't need to talk to me like that. Like, you sit over there. And then directs the anger directly at me. I'm like, Okay, you know, and it just shows that, you know, uh, if that were me that said that to him, I don't know what would have happened, right? It wouldn't have been good, and it probably would have been a life-threatening circumstance. Um, so when, you know, I was, I got a call from the Nets when I was actually out in the ocean. I was about 60 miles offshore, and I was actually next to an oil rig um, where I randomly got signal, and I got a call from them saying, hey, you know, we would like to, to join us in the bubble. You know, uh, would you be interested in coming? I was like, yeah, I want to come. And uh, uh, we got back to land, cleaned all the fish that we caught. And they had a car for me there. And I drove over to Florida. And um, going into, you know, the bubble, I just knew that, uh, you know, there was going to be, you know, uh, a level of activism, right? And it was going to be a, a place where we could actually really show, you know, how we felt about the issue. and. I think that was about 80% of my decision to want to go was to be able to actually be, you know, on that platform where, you know, we finally were playing and we knew we had the viewership. We knew we had people that were going to be tuning in and it was the perfect stage to actually really, you know, push the message forward. And uh, that really went into my decision to go. Visually, uh, you know, when you put that Jersey on, you guys had the opportunity to have messages. Yeah. on the backs of your jerseys um and you did so what did you choose and and why um i chose say her name and uh a lot of people think that you know the uh say her name uh is specifically for brianna taylor which it is but it's not it's for all african-american women who have been uh at the hands you know of Know, foul play that lost their lives, right? And that was uh, something that was created by uh, Kimberly Crenshaw. Um, she was the one that started the movement. She's also an activist. And uh, it's something that really just brings awareness to you know the, the, li the lives of black women who uh, lost their lives, like I said, uh, at the hands of you know foul play. And I wanted to do that because I think that, that it's very important to me, right? I've got asked this question in the bubble. A reporter asked me, she said, um, why do you, she asked the same question, why do you have that? And I was like, um, I have it because, you know, it's important to me, right? Because I wanted to see, you know, where she was at with the question. And she was like, um, do you know, uh, do you know what say her name means? She was like, 
I was like, yeah, I know what it means. Uh, and I was being short with her because I wanted to see, you know, that, like, why are you prying me for a question I know the answer to, right? So she's like, well, the say her name isn't only for Brianna. I was like, I know that. And then I just threw certain facts at her. I threw who started it. I threw, you know, the other women that were, you know, that were highlighted in uh, Tanisha Anderson, uh, okay. who else? Um, uh, Tatiana Jefferson. Uh, those were some other women that were, uh, you know, that have lost their lives and, you know, and it, that's kind of what the awareness was for, right? So she literally, her jaw dropped. I was like, I'm 32. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not 20 years old, right? Like, I'm not gonna do something aimlessly and not know why I'm doing it, right? So um, I chose that because, again, uh, it's, it's very important that, you know, to, to not only highlight, you know, the, the African-American males, you know, that have lost their lives, right? There was a lot of women who didn't get the national exposure like Breonna Taylor did, and she still needs to, you know, we still demand justice for her death. Um, that I can go on all about why that was all messed up, right? But the, you know, the deaths of the, you know, previous two women that I mentioned, they didn't get national recognition. I'm pretty sure that, you know, some of the people who are tuning in, that might be the first time they heard those names. Um, but yeah, say her name is very important to me. I wanted to make sure that it's on the back of my head. And this is, um, you know, a lot of players in the bubble uh, use their media availability to talk about this, to say their names, yeah. to, you know, to even kind of deflect from basketball, from the conversation of basketball, back to what was happening in society. It was bubbling over even before August 23rd. Yet another African-American man shot by a police officer, Jacob Blake, in Kenosha, Wisconsin, seven bullets, seven bullets in the back um, as three of his six children watched. And the and you know what? The players had enough. People that watched and saw that had enough. What do you recall from that day? Um, I was disgusted. Um, if you think about, you know, being a father or being a parent, right? The one thing you don't want to happen is for your kids to see harm being done to you, right? Like, and we can and we can dial this back. Let's 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 throw it to another aspect, right? When you see movies, right, and someone is about to get killed, what is the first thing they say? I have kids, right? Like, please, I, I have a wife, I have kids, I need, I don't want to die right now, right? And what do you think was going through his head when he saw the guns that were pointed at him, right? He had three of his children in the back seat, right? Seven bullets in the back. Come on, I mean, it, it it makes it makes no sense. It makes it makes absolutely no sense, right? And you know, from the the research that I've done, you know, obviously they said that there was, you know, uh, there was some type of sexual assault thing that you know the police came on the site to you know see why he was over there and. You know, from the people that were around him, they said that he, he was actually there breaking up an altercation between two women, right? And it was a rowdy situation. The cops came on the site and, you know, they were, you know, pretty hostile with him. And, you know, they said he resisted arrest and regardless of resisting arrest, they said he had a knife, you know, but the knife was in his car. He told them he had a knife in his car. He did not have the knife in his hand. It was in his car, but he told him it was that. And, uh, you know, seven in the back. I mean, that's excessive. And he didn't die, right? He's paralyzed from the waist down. Um, and he he's in pain, right? He says it hurts to breathe. It hurts to turn over. It hurts to eat. It hurts to, it hurts to do pretty much everything, right? Like, it hurts because he was in, he was trying to, you know, change his life. He moved from Oh, where did he move from? I believe it was Chicago. I might, I might be skewing that information, but I think he moved there to become a mechanic, right? He was trying to turn his life around. And, you know, he's not going to be able to do that. You know, he's not going to be able to do that. He's not going to be able to run around his kids again. He's not going to be able to, you know, do the things that he was able to do before that day, right? And um, it, it's, it's, it's bad. It's really bad. And it's, it's a disgusting thing. And athletes had enough, right? It wasn't just... It wasn't just the NBA, you know, obviously the Milwaukee Bucks were the first team that actually, you know, took a stand and said, we're not playing. And this was right in the playoffs. Like this was a big deal to stop playoff basketball. Everyone's like, no, we're not playing. This is ridiculous. Right. And 
excuse me, um, the WNBA stopped. Um, there were some MLB games that they were like, we're not playing. There was MLS games that said they didn't want to play. NFL teams were, I believe, in training camp or practicing. They didn't want to practice, right? And it was something where it was just like, enough is enough, you know? And, you know, for those who haven't had the opportunity to actually see, you know, his interview, you know, of him while he's on the bed in the hospital talking about the experience and what really happened, you need to watch it. Um, it's very eye-opening um, and it, it'll really put in perspective um, what, you know, that experience was like for him to, to, to feel that hot leg go through his body. And he knew his kids were maybe five feet away from him. So the, the, you, you, can't, you can't erase that memory from the kids, right? And, you know, they were all different ages. I believe they were eight, five, and I think three, right? The three-year-old still remembers what happened. The five-year-old definitely knows what happened. The eight-year-old, a hundred thousand percent knows exactly what happened, right? And they'll never forget that day, right? They're probably going to be scared of cops the rest of their lives, and rightfully so. Like their dad got shot down right in front of them. I mean, I know that they're you know very blessed that he's still alive, right? But just the fear. Like I'm pretty sure every time they see a cop, they're gonna they're just gonna get chills running through them. Right? They're gonna be petrified, you know, and you know, the average black man gets petrified when he's pulled over by a cop, you know, just because we know that the situation that can escalate at any point in time, right? But we didn't see anything like that as a young age, you know, at least, you know, I didn't, right? But like to know that they've endured that and saw that and have to live with that, um, it scarred them for life. And, you know, we, we've all had enough. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty bad. The, and then, and, they during the protest, uh, what's his name, Kyle Rittenhouse, uh, goes and kills two protesters, you know. And I mean, come on, so enough's enough. This is ridiculous. So, while all this is going on, your teammates, other players in the bubble, coaches, you know, everyone that's there is trying to process, make sense of all of this. Um, what was the initial dialogue you heard about a potential walkout, stoppage, protest? You know, what. What did you hear and how were you kind of processing this and your role and what it potentially could could end up being? Yeah, um, I remember when I heard about it, we weren't in the play. We lost uh, first round. Um, so we weren't actively in the bubble anymore when this happened. But I still had friends that were there that were still in the playoffs and still playing. And, you know, I was just trying to check the temperature of the bubble because I wasn't there anymore. And I knew, you know, that there was an uproar. You know, I knew the guys had enough. I knew that, you know, um, it was, it was really, you know, deflating because we couldn't be with our families at that time, you know, and we were literally confined in the bubble, you know, away from our loved ones. You know, we couldn't hug our families. You know, we, we couldn't, you know, the, the fathers in the bubble couldn't hug their sons and daughters, you know, and tell them they loved them, you know, and it, it, it was, you know, I, I was disgusted, but I'm not a father. And there were, like I said, there were a lot of fathers in there who probably put themselves in his shoes and wow, you know what I mean? I, I can't I can't even begin to imagine, you know, what that was like, especially three of his kids. I mean, it was it was tough, but I know that, you know, um the dialogue was, hey, you know, we're not playing, you know, and it was, you know, it was a it was a big stand, right? And, you know, um, even Stephen A. Smith, you know, he he walked off the set like this. Enough is enough. You know, like I can't be here right now. I can't act like, like I want to be here and speak. Right. A lot of people were disgusted by the whole thing, and it uh, it really it really brought awareness to what you know the, the climate of you know the world when it comes to this you know is, is really like, and it, it's it's devastating. It was really it was a really tough time for me. Um, and I, it was even tougher for the guys in the bubble because I actually was able to go see my mom, see my family, and, and, and wrap my arms around them, you know, but the other guys didn't have that lunch. So, you know, we know what, we know how it played out. You know, there were games that were postponed. The NBA, the coaches seemed like they leaned in and supported the players in this protest, in this stoppage. Um, there weren't any immediate consequences for any of the players that took a stand. I think it was, there was compassion there, but there was a return to play. Yeah. 
and it seems that the league in a way pivoted uh, to actionable change through voting campaign, you know, getting people registered, um, PSAs, it was everywhere, right? Do you feel satisfied um, with the response to the players boycott and the ensuing actionable change that the league was driving? Yeah, the uh, I believe what you're referencing is the more the more than a vote campaign, mm -hmm. and uh, that was you know it, it needed to happen, right? It it was the time where you know everything was heightened, right? This was formed you know not long after all the deaths you know that we just spoke about previously, and it was put in place to uh, eliminate the equality you know um, for the you know the black voter you know, the, and for, you know, the police brutality and racial inequality, right? Like we didn't want to feel like our votes were suppressed, right? And a lot of people, you know, don't vote. I mean, that's just what it is. Like, it's like, eh, my vote doesn't matter. You know, eh, what's one vote gonna do, right? But if millions of people have that mindset, that's a millions of votes that don't get counted, right? And the, uh, I believe, you know, LeBron James was one of the people who spearheaded, you know, this initiative um, alongside some of his, you know, friends. I believe Dwayne Wade was a part of it and, um, you know, a, a couple other guys. And um, it was great. You know, I think that it was important that, you know, we had the app inside the bubble where everyone was able to register to vote. You know, um, we were able to use uh, a lot of other arenas that, you know, we obviously couldn't play in you know, as places, you know, for, you know, uh, polling and, you know, for registration to vote. So these big arenas, you know, where obviously we used to play was actually, you know, used as something that really helped get people out there to vote and be, you know, uh, active in it. And I believe we have recruited about 20,000 you know, people for polls to be ready for election day, right? So uh, a lot of people came out to vote. And I think that the initiative was very successful um and i think that it should be something that should be in place for you know for time to come i think that it shouldn't be a one-off thing i think it needs to be something that you know needs to keep hitting home right because like you mentioned earlier we have the platform we have people who you know follow us who follow our footsteps who wanna you know so who wanna you know be like us right so if we're you know preaching vote 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 voting is important you know, don't sit back and let other people make decisions for you. If you feel a certain way and you want to make change, do your part. And I think it's very important. And I do, you know, I was, I was very, very pleased with the way it was executed and the, uh, the results of how many people actually registered and how many people actually showed up to these places and actually were there on election day. And it seems like, you know, a lot of people before the pandemic, um, you know, turned to sports as a method of escapism. You know, you want to sit down, relax, you want to turn on the game, you know, be entertained. Um, that's at least some people's motivation for, for watching sports and engaging. It's, it's, it's an escape from the day to day. You watch your favorite team, your favorite players. Now you turn on the TV and across sports, there's kneeling, there's protesting, there's unity. And you saw it across all the major sports. You can't turn on your TV or watch a game without seeing um, or hearing a reflection in a mirror of what's going on in society. So Lance, do you think that, you know, um, owners and coaches and executives are now understanding and really hearing athletes on, you know, on these political topics, or, you know, is this something that is in vogue and might revert back to uh, some of the consequences we've seen for athletes that have spoken out in the past? Um, I, I do believe that they they understand and that they are you know starting to advocate for us and to actually get it. Um, I, I particularly can you know uh, speak on behalf of Doc Rivers, um, someone who actually spoke out um, about all this you know um, and he made it clear where he stood with everything. He sped up as well, right? And I think that if executives, coaches, whomever, revert back you know, and try to act like, you know, it's a nuisance or, you know, a distraction, then, you know, they were, you know, they and they were two-faced, right? They, they supported it while it was relevant, right? And while it was trending and when it eventually dies out a little bit and the narrative starts to change for different things, are they still going to be, you know, there to, 
really push the envelope and try to, you know, keep change going, right? And I think that, you know, a lot of people, um, a lot of people like to really jump on things that are trending, right? And show that they care, right? But again, when, when the dust settles, um, the problem didn't go away, right? And all, all these things that are happening is to bring awareness, right? Like kneeling and all this stuff isn't going to make, you know, police and all these, you know, other things go away, right? It's bringing awareness to it. It's making people, you know, understand what's really happening, right? The same with, you know, breast cancer awareness, you know, the ribbons and wearing pink, right? Buying a pink shirt and all these things isn't going to cure breast cancer, right? But having awareness and actually supporting the cause and actually really pushing the envelope to try to really, you know, provide the resources and things to really help find the cure, help, you know, these treatments and help, you know, these men and women, because men get breast cancer as well. I know a few that have it, um, to really help push, you know, to try to really help these people, right? So that's the same thing with this, right? This is our, this is the biggest civil rights movement in history, right? And there were, you know, a bunch of other countries that actually, you know, felt, you know, for us here, like, you know, there were protests in other countries, right? That was not the case, you know, back, you know, during, you know, the original civil rights movement with the freedom riders and all that stuff. It was like, oh, that's not our problem, right? Um, and, you know, I, I can go on a rant, you know, I, 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 I'm a little bit of a historian and I, like I mentioned earlier, I, I do my research before I speak, but um, I, I really do believe that, you know, if, these executives and all these people, you know, really, you know, are, are really trying to say and, you know, advocate, you know, that they care. We'll see if they care when, you know, when whatever hits the fan next time around. That's wonderful feedback. Um, and before we take a couple of questions from our community, I do want to talk about slang magic and how you have essentially, um, you know, taking one of your passions outside of basketball, um, turned it into a business and also an incredible vehicle for giving back. Um, and you've done so um, in such a great way. So tell us about Slang Magic. And uh, particularly, I'd love for you to share because I know you're humble or whatever, but what you've done during the COVID-19 pandemic to feed communities is, you know, should be praised. Uh, so tell us a little bit about that as well, please. Uh, there you go. Um, Come on. Um, well, uh, Slang Magic Fishing is uh, my fishing company. And we, uh, we are a, uh, a fishing team, a professional fishing team. We compete in uh, Blue Marlin uh, tournaments for, in the Gulf uh, Coast from Texas all the way to Florida. Uh, we compete in about five tournaments a year. Um, we also have a lifestyle brand um, associated with us where we, we sell merchandise and we also do uh, private charters in the Gulf of Mexico uh, with us. Um, we also have uh, youth ambassadors for our program. We have, uh, what do we have? We have uh, 24 uh, kids in our program right now, uh, 12 boys, 12 girls from all over the country um, who uh, are ambassadors for the brand. We also started um, a nonprofit called the Trust Your Work Foundation. And our mission is to inspire the youth to achieve their own personal goals and reach their maximum potential while exposing them to resources to become a better, more well-rounded leader. And we use the sport of fishing as the vessel, uh, pun intended, um, to really help these kids, you know, be successful. And um, like I mentioned, we have 24 kids um, between the ages of 10 and 18 from all over the country, um, half boys, half girls. And uh, we really try to really help them uh, hone in on you know, their leadership. It's more, you know, also a person development program. And we try to help the kids achieve whatever goals that they have, whether they're fishing related or not. Um, we try to, you know, really teach them that, you know, really valuable life lessons. Um, you know, in a world where they've been born into social media, we teach them the do's and don'ts of social media. Uh, we teach them how to, you know, build their own personal brand um, and what a brand is. Um, we, you know, we teach them the different types of leadership styles, you know, um, you know, there's a bunch, you know, uh, the, the, the vocal leader, you know, that's pretty much what, you know, when I ask my kids, this is a funny thing. When I ask my kids, what, you know, what do you think a leader is? You know, some of our younger kids are like, you know, someone who tells people what to do, 
right? And I was like, you know, well, that's not the only way to be a leader, right? So we really dive into really showing them, you know, what the, you know, different type of leadership styles are and how, you know, we can hone in and help them become the best leader that they can be. Um, we also uh, teach them uh, the importance of giving back uh, to the community. Um, me growing up, uh, you know, giving back or community service was also seen as a punishment, right? And I don't want our kids to see helping people as a punishment, right? So we do a lot of give back in the community. We worked with um, Fabian Cousteau, um, who's the grandson of the late Jacques Cousteau, who's an aquanaut. And we worked with his um, nonprofit, the uh, Fabian Cousteau Ocean Learning Center to help do a, a beach cleanup in Long Beach, um, Long Island uh, last summer. Um, we also did, uh, we did a, a, a seafood Thanksgiving um, for the uh, children and staff at the Covenant House in New Orleans um, the day before Thanksgiving. Um, so we wanted them to be able to have fresh fish from the Gulf of Mexico and to, you know, just enjoy it, you know, and to put smiles on their faces and to be able to really, you know, reward the staff for all the amazing work that they do and the time that they put in for, you know, all the people who really need it there. Um, and we do a lot, but specifically what I think you were asking for the, what I was doing during the pandemic, we started this initiative called Share Your Harvest. And with that initiative, we um, we went out. Uh, well, I was in New York. I was locked down here. But I had my team uh, go down there, and they uh, they took the boat out, and they caught a bunch of uh, yellowfin tuna. And we were uh, able to, you know, feed uh, some of the first responders in New Orleans, you know, the doctors, the nurses, excuse me, the fire department police department, local churches, people in the service industry, um, and, uh, you know, people that were, you know, some of the elderly people in specific communities, we were able to provide them with, uh, with food that was helped uh, being prepared by a friend of mine named Brad McGee um, at the Blue Line Sandwich Company in New Orleans, and we were able to feed, you know, um, over 1,200 people, you know, with that initiative, and that was just in New Orleans, and I told the guys, I was like, well, the bike's hot, so keep going and then send me some of that stuff up to New York because I have friends here that I want to help. And in New York specifically, I wanted to help my friends in the service industry. I had a lot of friends and family that worked in that industry and they they all lost their jobs during COVID. And, you know, I didn't want them to worry about, you know, spending money on food, right? There was a whole bunch of other things that they were going to be worried about, you know, how to make rent, you know, X, Y, and Z, and I was like, whatever money that you have, whatever you're going to be getting from the government, I don't want you to spend that on food. So we, you know, we started uh, feeding. Uh, I believe our initial number was, I think we started feeding, I think, 20 people, and then it just everyone. I told everyone else to bring the next wave every two weeks. I was like, each one of you bring on somebody new, and it just every two weeks we just kept increasing how many people we were feeding and we reached out to some local farms here in New York, um, Covey Rise Farms, which is actually in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where we were buying fresh produce from them because I knew that they were sitting on a lot of harvest um, because nobody, the restaurants were closed. So I knew they had a bunch of fresh vegetables and I wanted to help them. So I bought a bunch of CSA boxes from them and I paired it with the fresh fish and I gave it to a bunch of my friends. So we've been feeding people from March until the end of July, every two weeks with, you know, fresh fish and uh, fresh vegetables. So that's what we did. I'm not going to tell you all the other stuff. If you want to know, you can, you know, look at our website or reach out. Um, no, and it was incredible to see the gratitude and actually meet some of the folks that were recipients of this incredible goodwill. Because um, you were, once the reopening started, you were out there actually supporting them you know, at their restaurants and, um, you know, bringing your friends along. And I just thought that was, it was so cool. And it's so good of you because you really live it. Everything that you've said so far tonight. So, um, so proud of you. Uh, I want to take uh, one question we got from Burton. Um, he wants to know, Lance, how um, you feel about brands getting into the conversation and utilizing professional athletes or athletes in general, really, um, as their mouthpiece. Brands using the athletes? Yeah. Um, I, I think it, it goes twofold, right? I think that um, one, uh, the brand has to align with the player, right? And two, the brand has to actually have confidence that 
you know, the player is going to be true to themselves and not just say what the brand wants them to say for uh, a paycheck or anything like that, right? I think if these brands wanted to say something that was important to them, these brands can say it themselves, right? Um, a lot of these, there's, there's a lot of really big companies who have amazing CEOs and are, you know, these companies are, you know, multi-million dollar companies. Um, and if they need, if they had a statement they wanted to say, say it, right? There was a lot of, you know, companies who spoke up about, you know, the brutality that was happening and that they supported, you know, you know, Black Lives Matter and whatever that they can do to really help you know, the families through the tough times and to really, you know, keep awareness for, you know, what is happening. And there were some brands that were silent and there's nothing wrong with silence, right? Like everyone doesn't have to speak up on all these things if you if it's not, you know, near and dear to you and if it doesn't really move you, right? Like no one's getting, you know, their hand slapped because they didn't speak up about it. So there's a bunch of people that didn't speak up about it and that's okay, right? But don't act like it's not happening. Right. And don't, you know, turn, you know, your back towards it, you know, because it doesn't affect you. Right. I'm pretty sure even if, you know, everyone, you know, I believe has someone, you know, of color that's a friend, you know, and imagine if one day they weren't here anymore. Right. And how would you feel about that, especially if it was at the hands of, you know, the same way that some of the, you know, the, the deaths that we spoke about previously happened. Right. So always put in perspective that, you know, these things are gonna to continue to happen. And if you have the voice, if you have, you know, the privilege, you know, to be able to help influence change, you know, I think that it takes a lot of courage and bravery to do it, but, you know, uh, a lot of meaningful things that happen in history, um, they happen because of the courage of, you know, brave individuals. You know, you talk about, you know, uh, you talk about Malcolm X, you talk about Martin Luther King, you talk about, you know, um, Muhammad Ali, you talk about people who actually spoke up what they believed in the time where, you know, people were really losing their lives, you know, and people were dying, you know, publicly dying, like, and no one was held accountable for it, right? And they still spoke up about a lot of these things, right? That's courage, right? What Kaepernick did, that's courage, right? what people can do now, educating their friends and families on exactly what has been happening, right? The organizations that are put in place right now to help, you know, foster change and to bring awareness and to help push the envelope and hold, you know, people in power accountable, you know, to really make sure that these people who have done these unjust things get, you know, just to serve. That's important, right? If you're gonna, you know, remain silent about it, you know, when you actually can help, you know, uh, it's, it's very unfortunate. There's a lot of people that are going to be like that. It's incredibly profound. And, you know, we look to um, community. We look to, um, you know, people leaning in and, and really supporting this. this. These cycles of, you know, interde interdependence expand the potential for ongoing uh, discussions concerning social issues that are affecting our communities. And in order, you know, in order for one to accomplish their mission, you have to be supported by those with the intention to spread the same message. And in this case, a lot of the cases we're talking about that message of protest and the reality of social progress, as we learned, you know, from history, um, we're in the midst of an increasingly divisive national community. And it's often mirrored by what we're seeing in sport and the response there. Yeah. When, you know, from a sports business perspective, as we look to kind of wrap this session out, you know, we're looking at the development of, of revenue generation, of marketing and branding and media content and fan engagement and how they're increasingly paying attention to the voices of athletes who take on the responsibility um, to speak on behalf of those who simply don't have that platform or don't have a voice. So, you know, um, as, a, as a professor that, you know, will teach sociology next semester as a doctoral student that has been studying uh, the effects of athlete activism, you know, on, on global sport, um, I look to the future and I'm inspired. Um, and Lance, I can't thank you enough for, for joining me uh, on my first ever faculty chalk talk. Uh, it's been incredible and I love hearing what you say and I'm sure uh, the attendees do as well. Thank you. I mean, honestly, uh, it's been uh, an awesome experience to really, you know, speak to someone one that I care about, we've been friends for so long, but to really 
you know, get a lot of these things that I've really been feeling out, you know, and, you know, you're really good at interviewing, by the way. It was very <laughs> easy to talk to you, um, that this was, this was a, a very easy dialogue. And I think that um, the way that, you know, I feel about a lot of these things, um, there's a lot of people who feel that way. I'm pretty sure there's people that are, that have joined us tonight that actually feel the exact same way, right? And again, I encourage, you know, um, for those who feel like they can't make a difference, you can make a difference, right? And again, like I mentioned, you can educate people. You can send someone an article, read this. If you didn't think this was a big deal, read this. Read exactly what happened. Read what's happening. Read, read about the case that didn't happen, you know, that ha didn't happen to make national news a year ago. Think about all the other instances that happened that wasn't recorded, that didn't, you know, where somebody's camera phone wasn't there, right? Where the body camera mysteriously wasn't on from a cop, right? Like think about all those instances and these people need to be held accountable. So educate your friends who aren't educated on these things and don't be afraid to, you know, stand out when it comes to wanting to educate people in this because that's the only way change is gonna happen. Change isn't gonna happen overnight, right? It's gonna to have to be something that happens over time, but it needs to be consistent. And just because it's not trending at a certain point in time doesn't mean that it doesn't need attention. It doesn't need people who are really trying to inspire change. So that's my message to all of you. Um, again, Gina, thank you so much for having me. This was awesome. Uh, and again, I'm really grateful to have you as a friend. I'm really grateful to be able to voice my opinion to some of your students, your friends, your family, and some of my friends are in here too. Um, I see a few of my friends, Emily's in here, Ray's in here. Thank y'all so much for coming in here uh, and supporting me throughout this talk. Um, but again, I'm, I'm really grateful uh, for the opportunity and I'm going to continue to do my part. Thank you, Lance. Um, I can't wait to see what's next for you, uh, you know, throughout your, your career, um, from high school to college to, you know, your, your experience in the pros, you've been against all odds thriving um, and have made a huge impact um, on sport with your teammates and in the community. So keep going. We all want to see what's next. I'm going to keep it going. <laughs> <laughs> all right, y'all. Thank you so much for joining our faculty chalk talk. This is the final one of the fall 2020 semester. I'm Professor Gina Antoniello here with Lance Thomas, NBA veteran um, and activist. So we hope to see you next semester for more of this. Good night, everyone. Take care.